Hello and welcome to the NASA Open House in conjunction with the Presidential Inauguration 2013. I'm John Yimberg, NASA with NASA's Office of Communications and the agency's social media manager and today's host. I want to welcome our NASA social attendees who are in the audience today and also give a special welcome to those that are here for the Presidential Inauguration. During the open house, you'll have the opportunity to hear from several of our leaders here at NASA headquarters who are out at the forefront of space exploration and research. Those individuals provide the leadership, planning, and policy decisions for the agency to achieve NASA's missions. And we want, uh, we want you here in the audience to be watching uh, at home to know that you can also participate in today's event by using the hashtag pound ask NASA on Twitter and Google Plus. Follow us on the stream on Facebook. And we're also, you can watch us on Ustream at www.ustream.tv slash NASA HDTV and ask questions there as well. We try to make these events more of a participatory conversation instead of uh, just a panel of people briefing about what NASA is doing. So we want to be, be engaged and you to ask questions. What brings us here today and what we have in common is our passion for space exploration and especially for human spaceflight. Lori Garver is a passionate and dedicated to opening up spaceflight experience to as many people as possible. Lori is the deputy administrator for NASA, where she challenges all of us uh, to have a renewed focus on innovation and technology as the foundation for success for future grand exploration challenges. And she encourages all to reach out beyond NASA to collaborate with companies, academia, international partners, and individuals through challenges and competitions and bring the best ideas forward for the agency. Please welcome to the stage NASA's Deputy Administrator, Lori Garver. Thank you so much, John. That's a very nice uh, introduction. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming this afternoon to NASA headquarters as we celebrate uh, really what it is to be American, right? This is uh, a great weekend for uh, the country, and it's uh, very, it's with great pride that NASA participates in these activities. For those of you, as John said, who are here for the social, a special welcome. We take a lot of pride of it in innovation, and that's not just in space, but in on Earth as well. So NASA is on a bold course. We have all been challenged to reach farther than ever before. We have uh, within our half a percent of the federal tax dollar that uh, is invested in NASA, we have the ability to, as we have for 12 years, have people living and working in space on the International Space Station. They are learning how not only to make the planet uh, better for those of us here on Earth, but how to live and work in space so that we can go beyond. The President has challenged us to go next to an asteroid for the first time and then on our way to Mars. These are exciting times at NASA. That's about half of our budget, and the other half is split between the science programs, which are planetary science. You'll be hearing more about the Mars program, especially this afternoon, and uh, our Earth science program. One of our favorite planets I know right here on planet Earth, NASA has 16 operational satellites as we speak, studying every aspect of what it is that's happening in our plan on our home planet and our atmosphere. So NASA is uh, 55 years old. We have been delivering real benefits to the public for that entire time. We are part of the administration, and as I said, it is a thrill to be part of this public open house that we are having this weekend. So I uh, grew up in a small town in Michigan myself, and I was uh, raised by a family that uh, believed in public service. My grandfather was in the state legislature for 20 years. He was a farmer and was there really almost as a volunteer, part-time state legislature in Michigan in those days uh, to pass better bike laws for his fellow neighbors, to pass better laws for his fellow farmers. And uh, I grew up believing that public service was something we all aspired to. And when I moved to Washington, D.C., it was to volunteer to work for John Glenn, who was, in fact, at that time, uh, running for president. And I did that. A lot of us come here in order to leave the world better than we found it and leave this country better than we found it. So for me, the perfect place has been to be working at NASA somewhere that returns that benefit every single day. So NASA's vision is to reach for new heights and reveal the unknown so that what we do and learn will benefit all humankind. And that's what we do every day. So first this afternoon, we're going to have you hear from the actual people who have uh, been 
living and working on the International Space Station that I mentioned are toehold to the universe. And uh, they're going to talk to us about those very real benefits to humankind and to our future that are being developed on International Space Station. And then the next panel will be about the unbelievable, uh, exciting exploration of Mars and all that we are learning on the red planet. Uh, you're also going to hear about our outreach and education efforts. As John mentioned, this is a passion of mine and of all of NASA's. One of the things that we do is truly, hopefully, inspire the next generation so that they recognize they can achieve anything. And it is innovation that has made this nation great. It is that investment in things that uh, will advance technology and help return real benefit to the country that uh, NASA is such a key part of, and it's something we feel very strongly about. Uh, we have an incredibly bright future. We've had a very, very successful uh, last year. It is still January, so we're going to quickly show you just a couple minutes of a highlights video that goes into some of the things I mentioned that we accomplished this last year. Um, and then we'll have our couple of panels. So again, welcome to NASA. Thank you for being part of this amazing weekend. Um, Godspeed. is away.
It's a lot of stuff NASA's working on. That video helps highlight that. You know, I, I talked about it at the, at the top of uh, the broadcast, uh, part one in the air morning session, but, you know, there hasn't really been a time in the last 12 years where an American hasn't lived and worked in space. And I did the math, 12 years. So seventh graders that are alive today have never known a time where there wasn't humans permanently living in space, and that's pretty spectacular. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Sarah DeWitt with the Office of the Chief Scientist, who will moderate our next panel. Sarah? Thanks, John. I'm really excited to be here today and to be leading off this next discussion, uh, which is going to focus about on science on the International Space Station. I'm joined here by a couple of people who are really expert on that topic, believe it or not. Um, amongst them, they have a lot of experience in science, in um, piloting various aircraft. They have experience in building scientific instruments, in medicine. And as you may have guessed, based on the amount of royal blue here on the stage, they also have a little bit of space flight experience under their belts as well. Um, I'll let them tell you a little bit more about that, and I'll give you a brief uh, preview of it in our introduction. Um, our first panelist today, um, well, first of all, I just want to say, Administrator Charlie Bolden said earlier today something about talking and writing passionately. Um, our first panelist today is probably one of the pas most passionate people I know. Uh, he's actually in the middle of the panel here. His name is Leland Melvin, and <laughs> you can give him a hand here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give all the intros first and then we'll, we'll kind of get into the discussion. Um, Leland is the Associate Administrator for Education here at NASA headquarters in Washington. And in this role, he leads the agency in inspiring interest in science, technology, engineering, and math, or STEM, um, through NASA's mission. And earlier than that, he began his career at NASA in 1989 as an aerospace research engineer at the Langley Research Center in Virginia. He entered the Astronaut Corps in 1998 and served as a mission specialist on two space shuttle missions to the International Space Station. Uh, our second panelist that we'll hear from today is someone I work with on a daily basis. Her name is Gail Allen. She's sitting here to my left. She's, <laughs> Thanks, Leland. She's currently serving as the uh, acting chief scientist here at NASA and has previously served as associate chief scientist for life and microgravity sciences which you'll hear more about. And previously, she also worked in the Exploration Systems Mission Directorate and the Office of Biological and Physical Research. Our third speaker will be Lee Morin, who joins us from NASA's Johnson Space Center, where he's currently. There you go. There you go. He is currently working on the cockpit of NASA's newest spacecraft, the Orion module, which a lot of you have heard a lot about already. Um, prior to that, he also served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Health, Space, and Science with the Department wow. of State here in DC, which is really fascinating to me. Um, and he served on the EVA crew of STS-110 in 2002, and he's logged over 259 hours in space, including 14 of those through extravehicular activity. And our final speaker is Alvin Drew, who's also visiting us from the Johnson Space Center. <laughs> Alvin has logged more than 612 hours in space on STS-118 and STS-133. He has also served as Director of Operations at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center in Star City, Russia. And he has more than 3,500 hours of flying experience and has piloted 30 different types of aircraft. Amazing stuff. So for the next half hour or so, we're gonna talk about science on the space station. But first, I just want to give Leland a chance to also tell us a little bit about, even just beyond the science, how the space station serves as a tool for uh, educating and inspiring students and, and people around the world in STEM. Leland? Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, panelists. I would first like to say, uh, kind of what Charlie and Lori have said, that it's all about you tweeps getting our message out, because we can only inspire and motivate if we can get the word out. So let's give a round of applause to the, the tweets. I call, them, I call you guys tweets. I call you NASA social, I call you tweets. And, and I've seen cases where your, your tweets or your retweets have allowed kids to find opportunities to come work at NASA, to get internships, fellowships, and scholarships. And so this is the way that we have to help get you know, all the technology, all the things that we do in space means nothing if we don't have a pipeline of students that can allow us to continue that exploration. So I want to show you a little slide here. If we can go to the next slide, if it's there, about how we use the International Space Station to help inspire and motivate. 
If you look in the top left corner, we have uh, Dan Burbank talking to kids in Southwest Virginia, a very rural coal mining town, talking to kids about space exploration. They're able to ask questions to a space station astronaut. This lasted for over about an hour and a half. And these kids were just compelled and excited, and they did hands-on experiential projects after that related to ISS. So they got in charge and inspired to be scientists and engineers. If you look in the middle of the YouTube Space Lab Challenge, this was a case where 2,000 students from around the world recorded a two-minute YouTube video on something that they could do on the International Space Station. There were 60 finalists. There were judges like um, Neil deGrasse Tyson and uh, Stephen Hawking. They called these down to 60 students. And then the final two students had their experiments done by Sonny Williams on the space station. So this is a way to get kids engaged to think about research and science and how they can do something experientially using the ISS as a, as a vehicle. Also, Lego, how many kids in here play with Legos? Aiden, are you a Lego guy? <laughs> uh, you, you do everything else, so I know you're probably a big Lego, okay. So Lego, we have this wonderful partnership with Lego where they have Legos on Space Station, we have curriculum for teachers, and we have students doing you know, 1G experiments and then trying to answer the questions on how would this tool work in space. And so making that connection with what works on the ground but wouldn't work on space and vice versa. So that, that partnership and that relationship is very powerful. And how many of you in here play Angry Birds? By show of hands. Charlie? You? <laughs> we'll get you there. Angry Birds Space is the partnership with Rovio that sold, this, this game sold 10 million copies. 10 million copies in three days. And all the kids that are playing this game have, a, have once they go to the International Space Station and click on NASA, they can find out what NASA opportunities are. Gravity wells, planets, all these different things are ways that we can get kids engaged and motivated and inspired using the things and places that they currently are. And lastly, this past Friday, January 11th at MIT, there were 96, 147 teams from around the country doing something called zero robotics. This is where teams work together to do missions using these two blue and red robotic spheres that are positioned by astronauts in space. So this is how we can use this environment to get kids to program doing useful like mining and drilling operations using a robotic sphere. And these are the things that we do in the space station. So we'll talk some more about the education and outreach, but uh, that's kind of an overview of what we're doing in space. So, Great. Thanks. thanks, Leland. Um, really appreciate that quick little, uh, we'll wait for the mics to die down. There we go. Um, appreciate that quick little overview of just a, just the surface level of what uh, student opportunities are available with the space station. Um, obviously, there are a lot of other opportunities to do actual research, and Gail's going to give us a little bit of uh, background on the types of research um, that we do on the space station and how um, people from around the world are involved in that every day. Gail? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, panel and, panels and also the audience. Um, I have a, a couple of slides. If you could cue them up, I'd appreciate it. Uh, I just wanted to start out with a slide of the space station, hopefully we can get that, that is overlaid on a football field. And it just gives you the perspective of how large that uh, vehicle is, as you can see. Um, the space station has only been assembled, the full assembly, for about a year, a little over a year, and yet there have been over 1,500 investigations that have been conducted on it already. It's a unique space laboratory with international partners. And we are looking forward to doing hundreds of more experiments just in 2013. So this really is the dawn of, of exploration utilizing the ISS. The next slide will just show you a list of, uh, of and I'm going to look because I can't see, <laughs> a list of uh, the types of research we do. And it's a, it's a notional graphic. And part of it shows what our national lab partner it works with um, on benefiting Earth. And then on the right side, it shows where we're, what our mission is as far as it is concerned in the um, sciences and technology. So for one area, we work biotechnology and biology. The biology is looking at what, how organisms, whether they're plant or other living organisms, actually respond in no gravity environment. We're trying to under, understand how cells respond and react. For the biotechnology, we're really looking at taking the biology that we're learning, mixing it with technology, and coming up with products that are useful in applications for either medicine or agriculture or areas like that. 
for human research, we have a very vested interest, and you can see that most of the human research is on the NASA side, because this is where we're actually doing research on the humans, um, <laughs> on the ground and in space, the guinea pigs. Um, they, we have identified risks that require uh, us to be able to mitigate them with some kind of countermeasure. And to do that, we have to have to run human um, expo or human research program experiments. So the examples are bone and muscle, where we know we've been heard several times about the bone loss that we have in space and the uh, muscle atrophy. Learning how to mitigate those through exercise and diet helps us also learn how to handle osteoporosis or any of the debilitating muscular diseases that we have here on, on Earth. Um, for the cardiovascular, we know that there are changes in the heart. The things that we learn to help keep our crew safe when we go further into space also help us learn how to handle heart disease here on Earth. Uh, nutrition, we've learned that minerals and vitamins do not absorb the same way in microgravity as they do on Earth. So we're learning through diet and exercise how to keep the crew healthy, but also looking at um, age, the, the elderly that are bedridden. They're, they have the same uptake concerns and issues that we have with the uh, crew, so we, we can re relate what we learn in space back to home on Earth. We also have uh, uh, radiation, uh, and we don't do as much radiation. We monitor the radiation, obviously, because all the crew is exposed to radiation. We do a lot of that on the Earth, but we do have radiation monitoring and technologies for um, monitoring the radiation on the ISS. And the last one I just want to mention is the immunology. And that's another area where the crew, actually, the, their immunology or their immune system is depressed in space, and they could be prone to more um, sensitive, more sensitive to viruses and, and uh, things like that. So we're looking at developing, um, looking at things like uh, uh, salmonella, and looking how we can, because they become really very prolific in space, so we're using that to determine whether or not how to treat it and maybe find some kind of mitigation strategy for, that we can actually have a, a medication here on Earth uh, for salmonella. The last couple of things I want to mention is the, are the tech demos. Technology is another very big in piece on the, on the Earth, on the uh, space station. And one of the two things we've talked about a couple of times is a robonaut, and we're looking at how the ro uh, robotics can map with the humans and actually maybe do some of the, of the operations on station and give the, our crew more time to do maybe more research. And I was also wanted to make, mention about the robotic refueling because the Dexter arm out there is actually, and I think Mr. Gerstmeyer mentioned that this morning, it's really a very big thing for us because if we can learn how to refuel satellites in space, we can extend the life of them for a very, very long period of time. I wanted also to mention, it says astrophysics, but I, in the big, big area of space, of science. I will we'll mention astrophysics because we have a, the alpha magnetic spectrometer and we call astrophysics the physics of the universe. And we have an alpha magnetic spectrometer that is measuring the cosmic rays. Um, it was launched in May of 2011 and I just checked if you go to ams.nasa.gov um, it actually has a counter and I, when I came down it had counted 28 billion 700 in some cosmic rays since it was launched and put on station. So that's pretty significant because that helps us learn and understand about the origins of the universe. And I wanted to talk about Earth science as well because we do have a tremendous opportunity of using the ISS as a platform looking back on, on Earth. And one of the experiments that we have on there is the HICO, which is a hyper, hyperspectral imaging for coastal oceans. And what that instrument can do, it's mounted on the outside of the station, but what that instrument can actually do is measure the depth the clarity and the amount of chlorophyll in the oceans along the coastlines, which is very helpful in the uh, um, Earth observations. And, with, and the last thing I wanted to do is say, is say is use one example of the Dexter arm and the fact that when we talk about what the impact and the benefits on Earth are, and if we can go to the next slide, I just wanted to mention the Dexter arm because the Canadian arm, that the, the technology that was used for that arm, to develop that arm, has been used in the medical world, and a, a robotic arm has actually been developed and was used to remove an egg-sized tumor from the brain of a 21-year-old. And it was extremely re rewarding to be able to see her point to where the, the surgery took place. 
so it shows how um, compelling the type of research that we do on Earth can be on, on the station. And as the very last thing uh, to bring this and tie it all back, one of the things that the Space Act did in 1958 say that we as a NASA should acquire knowledge and disseminate it. And I want to go to what uh, Melvin said, is, or Leland said, is the fact that you all are another avenue for us. We can publish, we can go to conferences, but this is the today's world of how we get this information out. So thank you. Thanks, Gail. So as you can see, there's a huge variety of scientific work that's done on the space station, some of it externally and some of it internally. And so um, we're gonna toss it over to Lee next to maybe give us some examples of some of the work that he's done um, on inside and maybe possibly outside the space station as well. All right, thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I wanna tell you about a couple of the uh, payloads, experiments that I've had an opportunity to work on. Uh, and there, there are a couple of slides if, if we can get those queued up, but I'm gonna press on. Uh, the first one is the Autonomous Missions Operation Payload, which will be scheduled to fly in 2014. And this builds on work that both uh, Alvin and I worked on last year where we had ground analogs, uh, yeah, there's the slide, the ground analogs of, the, of how you would change from having mission control, take care of everything and anticipate your every need and tell you everything that you need to do to a situation where you might be late minute or even late hours away where you have to be more autonomous and take care of things on your own. And uh, so what the AMO project will fly is a software interface uh, that the crew will have available and there'll be two, uh, two pieces of equipment that are very critical on the space station. That's the space station computer and also the uh, total organic carbon analyzer which monitors the water quality. And those are a uh, very important piece of equipment, but the crew needs to be able to maintain those. And so as they maintain those, they will rely on the AMO to tell them what to do rather than on the ground. Uh, and so this allows us to actually introduce into real ISS operations starting to wean the crew from total reliance on the ground to starting to rely on new computer tools and how to perfect those tools and how to actually work them into space station operations. So that's a very exciting experiment that uh, we're looking forward to. The next uh, thing I'd like to mention is to talk about the ARIS program, which is the amateur radio. If we could go to the next slide, please. Amateur radio on the International Space Station. Uh, of course, the space station has several ham rigs on it. And much of the time, those hand rigs are working as a repeater uh, without interaction with the crew on board. But this allows the amateur radio community to use the space station as a relay satellite and to do contacts with other amateurs on the ground by way of the space station, which they also do with other, other satellites. Uh, and the benefit to NASA of that is, is that we always have lots of amateurs listening to the space station. So if we need to go to an emergency backup mode and use that communication for in, in the event of an, a contingency, we'll have a built-in uh, ground control network uh, in, in parallel to our other communication channels uh, readily available. So that's, that's the win for NASA. But it's also possible for the uh, crew on board to pick up that microphone and to talk to those uh, uh, amateurs' uh, hams on the ground, and that's been very successful. But that's been further leveraged with the ARIS program where we would enlist dedicated amateurs who would go to schools and set up communication links at the school and have that as a keystone, keynote, for a, a whole number of STEM activities. And so the students can learn about Ohm's law and radio and all sorts of other things related to, to physics and, and science activities and make it very tangible because they're going to have prepare questions for the astronauts. Those are sent up to the astronauts and then the, the students practice their questions so they can really get them out. And so that 10 or 20 students can ask the astronauts and get an answer uh, live uh, as the space station passes overhead as the culmination, and, and we, this has been done over 700 uh, times in over 44 countries that you can see marked in green on the, on the map there. Next slide, please. Uh, and there is also a very important benefit uh, to the astronauts on board, which is that 
when you're with a small group of three people or six people on the space station for three months, six months, or, or a year, uh, you can get feeling very isolated up there. But the, the uh, ability to pick up that microphone and talk to amateurs on the ground and talk to students uh, really makes it very tangible of the, the role that you play and the importance that you have to the, all the citizens all across this planet of ours. And so that is a very emotionally uplifting experience uh, and very rewarding for the crew. So that's, that's a real win-win situation. And when you have a student who gets to talk and ask an astronaut a question after having spent uh, activities learning about ham radio and, and physics, that's a STEM uh, experience that uh, they probably will remember for a long time. And we hope that that's a formative experience that will help some of those become the engineers that we're going to need in the years ahead. Thank you, Lee. And finally, I'd like to uh, hand it over to Alvin. And I was wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit about what it's like to actually, for astronauts to use their own bodies in science experiments. Um, you know, it's, it's part of the learning process up there. And, and if you have any other stories to share with, sure. with us. Sure. As one of the things you alluded to was that you know, one of the primary payloads on board the space station for science are the astronauts themselves. Uh, most anybody who's doing research on the human body knows that there's wide variability amongst people, you know, no two people have the same fingerprints. And the way to get things that you can have reliance on is this, this, this all, you know, sacred N, the number of pe subjects you can have in, a, in an experiment. And last time I checked, there weren't even 600 people who've been in space. And so, you know, if you just study out there in the regular world with, with 600 people as subjects, probably you'd get laughed out of most science symposiums. And so what they're trying to do is they desperately come to come to us before the flights because we're not really required to do any of these things where we're subject to their science. And they give you the pitch like, this is a really cool science project and this is really going to help us do things and please let us stick you with a needle or do something that, <laughs> might, that you might not like very much or, or something you just pretty innocuous like fill out a log book or things like that. So we all got to you know, participate in various experiments and you get to pick from a whole you know, different uh, group of things on that. I think in my last one they were trying to figure out trying to correlate with the fact that we do lose strength and physical conditioning on long you know, missions in space. Can they correlate you know, how much strength you might lose and how much balance you might lose to your ability to do realistic tasks, such as you might do if you landed on a planet like Mars. And so the first thing I did was you know, measure things like my peak strength and my balance, and then went out and did mission representative tasks like opening hatches and climbing up ladders and moving rocks and things like that uh, in order to do that after the mission. And so we do get to you know, be subjects ourselves. <laughs> now we also get to operate payloads or play with uh, science payloads in space too. And that's the other part of the benefit that we get in space. Uh, I believe in my first mission, uh, we were interested in nutrition. Uh, obviously, if you're going, to, going on very long missions, uh, you need to be able to have um, at least durable, if not renewable, food sources out there. Uh, one of the big problems we have with our current meals, although they, they work very well, they're, they're quite delicious, is that they, they are perishable. They have a shelf life to them. If you take uh, chicken teriyaki, chicken and teriyaki, and you put it in basically a bag, because we like TV dinners, because that's how we prepare them, is we can't cook meals in space. After about a year and a half, it is neither chicken nor teriyaki. We're not <laughs> sure what it is. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, it's something you just, you, you quietly put it in an airlock and you, you move out and you get, get rid of it. Uh, now, if you're going to do on very long missions that go on for more than 1,500 days, more likely you would go to Mars, you want something that's going to be good. You also want to have a source of fresh fruit and vegetables as well. So, but. Well, will these things grow and will they yield nutritious you know, foods when you're in the vacuum of space being subject to radiation and all and, and you know, weightless? And so we flew 10 million basil seeds on our very first mission um, in very thick, heavy duty plastic. Plus, if you, use, you could use this plastic for tire trays, quite honestly, uh, but it was not thick enough to hold the scent of 10 million basil seeds. <laughs> <laughs> and so the place smelled like an Italian restaurant, the whole thing. <laughs> and Rick Mastracchio, one of my crewmates, imagine, man, you, you can imagine, has a, a passion about Italian food. Um, at some point, after smelling it's about the fourth day and just jonesing for Italian food, just like, who do I got to kill to get a plate of lasagna up here? Uh, somebody clearly overheard him, uh, or he got relayed to the ground, because when we got to the ground on landing day, there was a big pan of lasagna waiting for us. Uh, so that was a happy ending of that story. The second thing I got to fly on both of my uh, missions were uh, mice. Uh, it turns out that, I don't know if it's in humans, I've, I've got a very dirt farmer's understanding of life sciences, because I'm a physical scientist and a, and a pilot. Uh, was that uh, we have, in my non-scientific terms, a couch potato gene. Uh, without this particular gene, well, we would all look like Mr. and Miss America. You know, you, you build muscles, and this gene says, no, turn that off already. Don't, don't get so big and muscular. Well, you can imagine space where our muscle and bone wastes away. 
um, you might want to turn that back on. And so we had a bunch of mice that we genetically altered uh, so that these guys were these Arnold Schwarzenegger mice. And would the, <laughs> that genetic tendency for them to become muscular overcome the wasting that you get from being in microgravity? I don't know what the, how that turned out. I just got to take the mice up there, and we got to n you know, name them and watch them every day. Um, but one thing I did observe while I was watching was that when you open this drawer up to look at these mice, we had to go film them and take pictures for the ground team, was that there were some mice who were just kind of clinging on for dear life. You know, they weren't quite sure what to do with this mice, you know, being weightless in space. Uh, there were some mice who, after the first day or so, um, had adapted. A few of them got sick on the first few days, just like we do. Um, but were just going about their normal tasks. They had to go, you know, go get water, had to go, you know, go get food, had to go use the bathroom, and they were just kind of. It's like microgravity is an inconvenience to be overcome, and they were just doing their particular job. And then there was a third group of mice who had just gone wild. No, <laughs> they just. Mice this was the wild. this is the coolest thing in the world. They're out there doing somersaults and tumbling. They're bouncing <laughs> off the heads of their fellow mice and just having a good old time. And I'm going. Wow, they act just like astronauts. <laughs> so clearly, whatever you know, Tom Wolf was trying to you know, identify as the right stuff isn't something that's isolated to human beings. It's clearly any type of mammal out there um, can, it has that in them to go out and do crazy things that astronauts do. Fantastic. That's really funny stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Alvin. <Robert. laughs> So at this point, we're going to go ahead and open it up to questions uh, here at the NASA Open House in the auditorium. If you can raise your hand really high, we have mic handlers that will come to you with a microphone. And also, when you, before you start your question, if you can introduce yourself, tell us your name and where you're from, that would be really helpful. And then as soon as we get a couple questions in here, we'll go online and find questions from our social media followers as well. So we've got one right down here in the front row. Hi, Jeff Wallace, Rocketman 520 on Twitter. Uh, Alvin and I was at your launch on 133. That was my first NASA social experience, so uh, that was a great time. Uh, question for, for all three of you uh, astronauts. Uh, tell us, you know, one or maybe two things about being in space that wasn't quite what you expected or you heard about it and it was a little bit more challenging than maybe you thought. Uh, the first thing for me was the whole idea of being weightless. You kind of think of this being this liberating, free experience. But you realize that everything you own is now liberated and freed, too. <laughs> <laughs> your pencils, your pens, your notebooks. It's like having a group of bad acting four year olds with you all the time. So you just, you couldn't just sit this bottle down. You know, the time it takes you to turn around, and look at something, and come back, it's gone. And where it typically floats is this area right behind your head. So you look left, you look right, and you can't play, where's my bottle? And somebody comes and grabs it and hands it to you and says, rookie. Um, <laughs> so that was probably my first thing I didn't quite expect about being in space. I, I think for me, and I think you've heard this story before, it's the biological systems <laughs> that don't act the same way that they do on the ground. But, um, but I think the other thing that was most impactful for me was when we had, we had finished installing the Columbus Laboratory, my first mission, and we had this meal with uh, all the crew members over in the service module. And we're sitting there breaking bread with African American, Asian American, French, German, Russian, the first female commander, Dr. Peggy Whitson. And we're traveling around the country at 17,500 miles per hour, you know, 240 miles up. And just to think of our civilization working in harmony together as one team when there are people on the ground that we're flying over that are fighting, still fighting. And so that was something that I, I didn't expect to feel that way about the human side versus the technological things that we do in space. I thought that would be more more empowering, more exciting, but it was more the human, the human element. Yeah. There's something that surprised me uh, about being in space was something I'd heard about, which is the smell of space. And I had been told by astronaut Dave Wolf about the smell of space, and I thought he was, you know, pulling my leg a little bit. But uh, we had a, a situation where we had a lot of heavy metal tools, EVA tools, that had been brought in after the first EVA, and these were being swapped out. And so these tools were ice cold, and there was a big pile of them. And our, uh, the, the space station commander, uh, Yuri, at that time, was sitting there, and he was kind of, it was like he was you know, smelling wine, you know? And he was like taking the odor up, and, and I, Yuri, what are you doing? And Lee, come here. And, and he's, you gotta smell this. And I smelled this, this aroma from this stuff that had been EVA, and. It, it smelled as if you had a extremely lean steak that you had seared on a white hot grill. And it had that, that pungent aroma of, of, of very 
you know, of, of meat, seared meat. Mm. And, uh, and it was very, uh, you know, very pungent. And over, as these tools heated up over the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes, that smell dissipated. Uh, but that was the smell of space. And that was something that I had heard about. And then I really experienced it. And it was, it was, uh, it was quite a surprise. Excellent. Looks like we have another question here in the room. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. uh, Jim Edwards here from Alexandria. Uh, of the research that's going on on the space station you know, currently, uh, how much of it originates uh, with NASA and how much with academic researchers and how much with industrial or corporate researchers? You want to take a stab at that? I'll take a stab at that, yes. Um, Actually, uh, w most of what NASA does, the research NASA does, is, is external. We, peer, we send out a solicitation, and so usually the research that we pay for is done by, mostly by academics. We do have some in-house work done. Uh, I wanted to mention on the second slide that I had shown is that our, we have been designated um, the U.S. portion, as an, half of it is the national lab. And that's where we have partnered in a cooperative agreement with uh, the Center for Advancement of Science and Space Cases to look for the commercial opportunities for us to be able to utilize the microgravity environment. Thank you. And I believe we have a second question back here, or a third question. Go ahead. My, na my name is Trey Yinkst. I'm a student at American University. And I was wondering, what kind of preparation um, do you do before you go to space uh, when it comes to your diet and exercise? And how nervous were you before your first space flight? You want to? Yeah. The, uh, in terms of diet and exercise, uh, you do have uh, help uh, or advice from a dietitian uh, who knows what you have available in terms of resources. There's also uh, an astronaut gym. And so you have the uh, coaches that will help you condition yourselves. and. Uh, I was doing EVA, and for EVA, you need a lot of forearm strength and hand strength. So there's lots of extra exercises that you might not normally do, uh, but you would do a lot of these exercises uh, to really build up your forearm strength. So it's kind of like the Popeye grip, you know, that you, that you want to have. So, uh, so those are some of the things that you did to prepare. Uh, in terms of being nervous before your first flight, I actually found in my case that the preparation and the teamwork had basically filled in all the gaps. So nothing that I experienced was really, un even though it was new, it wasn't unfamiliar. And so it, it, it was familiar. And I felt at home in, in all the situations that I was in. And I just had so much confidence in the skills that the training team had, had planned ahead and put in me that they didn't waste my time with stuff I did not need. But this, if I needed to know something, I knew it because they made sure I knew it uh, over you know, all the training that we had had, preparation before your selective flight and then the flight-specific training. All of that builds up. So I felt totally at home with everything. Uh, you know, my wife told me, well, you're too stupid to be scared like you should have been. <laughs> but but uh, I can honestly say that I, I wasn't uh, you know, nervous or, or afraid. Thanks, Lee. And we've got one right here. Hi, John. So you're from New Jersey. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned the suppressed immune system. So despite any sanitation efforts, how common is like the common cold? And does it tend to spread if the astronauts are up there? Well, we go in quarantine before we go to space. And I mean, you know, Lee's a medical doctor, so he can probably hit some of that more. But you know, there's a, it's a very sterile environment. And I don't think we've ever had a case of a cold up there, have we? Uh, maybe they did have, one. have in the earlier, uh, the earlier, mm -hmm. you know, before the shuttle missions, uh, they did have uh, one of the astronauts had a head cold in space. That was a, was a real problem. And after that, they instituted the quarantine, right. and, and and particularly uh, isolating the crews from exposure to children at that time because the children are, are, have a special risk in, in terms of uh, infectious illnesses like uh, the colds and things like that. How long is the quarantine procedure? It's about a week. We've got a question back yes. here in the middle, I believe. Uh oh, there. Aiden has another question. <laughs> Hi, I'm Aiden. This is probably my third question I've asked at <laughs> this social. So my question is, so if there's a capsule launching, instead of having the capsule be the mini escape pod, why don't you have a different mini escape pod? 
Yeah. 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 That's a really good question. Uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, when you, there's a lot of things you have to survive if you have to escape from a rocket for some reason. And you have to, uh, in fact, there's, you're, you're in the vacuum of space. Uh, most of the time out there, you have to, if you're back in the atmosphere, you're coming in at very high speed, so you have, wind can be a problem. Also, if you're coming in from high enough, the heating can be a problem. So probably the best thing to protect you while you're coming back in the atmosphere, some of those things, is to have a, your capsule itself. It, it actually is designed to enter the atmosphere stably on its own, and so it, it's probably the best thing to have for you. Now, of course, we wear suits inside of that, so in case the air goes away, we can still breathe on our own suit air. Um, we have other things to help keep us alive inside that capsule, but Honestly, if something did go wrong, the, the, the place I would much, well, would most like to be is inside that capsule with it protecting me on the way back down to the earth. Excellent. Thank you, Alvin. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. My name is Nick Joseph. I'm from here in the district. And this question is for anyone in particular. Uh, where would you like to see mankind's role in space in the next 50 years? Well, I, I think I would like to see humankinds, and I say humankind sometimes because we, the words that we say sometimes alienate others, like young girls will say, that's not for me, so I always switch it to humankind so we can make sure that we're inclusive of all, all people. Um, you know, we want to go to Mars one day in the next, I think, 30-something years, and I see us, you know, gearing up to be ready for that, that challenge. Um, 50 years. Um, you know, post post a Mars Mars landing, you see us maybe traveling to L two, L one, other other locations, but definitely Mars is the is the destination for for NASA. Right. Thank you, Leland. I think we've got a question from social media. We'll go ahead and take that one next, if you guys can, Dennis. Have there ever been suggestions of trying to send dogs or any pets to the ISS for companionship? or pet and space research? That's a good one. Anybody know that one? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I know that there's a, one of the things that I was working on when I was on my last mission was uh, to read, uh, start a program about bedtime stories from space. And then uh, the story I read was about you know, a dog going to the moon with a crew. And I think the guy's writing a follow-on companion piece uh, for a dog going to the ISS as a crew member there. So maybe the suggestion out there, we might start the ball rolling. And I just wanted to add one thing to that. Um, we have looked at uh, growing plants as part of the physiology to try to, you know, have um, hands-on types of things. So that's step one, and we're still working on that. So maybe the dogs are next. There you go. Start with plants and then go to animals. <laughs> and I, I, I took my dogs to Aww. station, Aww. as you probably know with Astroflow Twitter handle. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Uh, we've got one back here. Yes, go ahead. Uh, my name is Suzanne, and I'm from the district. I work with an organization that supports grant makers, and it's probably a business question. So my, con my question is, as funders, are we allowed to kind of uh, put RFIs out to support NASA, say corporate funding or community foundation funding? Do you solicit that kind of funding, or is this a strictly federally based funding option? I'll take one shot at that, um, and I, I probably, if we can hook up later, I can give you some more information, but uh, actually from NASA, we have appropriated dollars, and we can't accept anything other than what's appropriated by Congress for us. Um, but I would say if you are interested in doing something like that, the case is part of our side, the national lab part, um, it would be something, some, an avenue, a mechanism that you could look into. And then one other side of that, we have strategic partnerships where the partner brings one piece and NASA brings another piece. So we'll have access to space station and your partnership will bring maybe something else to, to go to a space station. So you're not augmenting our budget, but right. you are coming into a partnership where we all have different responsibilities in the partnership. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Good. Excellent Thank you. point. Mm -hmm. We've got another question here in the auditorium. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Dina Rosenberg from Boulder, Colorado. And uh, my question was, how do, they, how, how do you guys, when you're out in space, deal with all the sunrises and sunsets happening multiple times a day and lights going off and on? I mean, do you guys like hang out with a sad lamp for a few hours a day or yes. something like that to, to stay kind of in a regular circadian rhythm? Yeah, that's a good question because you have uh, 16 days every 24 hours. So the first part of that is you need to have really good sleep discipline, which means that you go to bed on time. 
And so for our crew, bedtime was 8 o'clock. And we had that bedtime in quarantine so that we, our bodies would be used to that bedtime. And that same time every 24 hours is the bedtime that we kept. And our commander was really, uh, he was a very laid back guy, except if people weren't going to bed on time, then he'd get really grouchy. So we would, would definitely want to get that sleep. And it's very important to do that because otherwise the crew, after about four or five days of uh, uh, you know, uh, hanging out, looking out the window when they should be getting rest, they will be worthless. And they'll make, a, you know, there's the possibility of, of making mistakes and things like that. So sleep discipline is the first thing. And so, you're, and so you need to protect the area from their sleeping from the sun and so that it's dark, you know, when, when you're sleeping. Uh, now, when you're doing EVA, you also need protection against the sunrise and the sunset. And the first thing is, is that there's a very big temperature difference between day and night. So it's about minus 130 degrees uh, during the night and plus 200, 250 degrees during the day. So it's a wide temperature extreme. Uh, and so to protect you from the cold, you have heaters on your gloves and you have little straps that you pull. They look like little shoelaces on your gloves that turn on the heaters. And you also have a little dial here. It's like a, a triangular knob that is kind of iconic if you look at any of the pictures of the spacesuit. And what that is is your thermostat. And so often the, the person who's helping you walk through your EVA, the IV in terms of inside the vehicle, the IV person helping the EVA person, and they would say it's five minutes to sunrise, uh, go ahead and uh, you know, set your thermostat and, and, and turn it down. And go ahead and turn off your glove heaters. Or then it's five minutes to sunset, go ahead and put on those glove heaters and reset your thermostat. And, you also have a visor, that uh, a gold shield visor that comes down because the, the sun is extremely bright and it's almost like looking at welding when you're EVA. So you have to be careful not to, uh, you, you'll get a, a headache from that, uh, to, you know, to put that, that visor down during the day and then turn it up at night so that you can see better with your headlights. So those are some of the things that you do both to control your circadian rhythm and to also handle the day-night. Uh, you know, every 40 minutes you're changing from day to night. That's something I've never thought about for sure, Lee. It sounds like we've got one more question from uh, the online community, and I think we might have to wrap after that one, but we'll go ahead and start with this one here. Do you dream while you sleep in space the same as you might on Earth? I, I dreamt many times in, uh, you know, in space, but I remember as I was trying to fall asleep, I would sometimes think I was dreaming about aliens because these high energy particles would actually hit your optical nerve and you would actually see green lights in your, in your head. And so you'd have your eyes closed, your commander would have you, you know, in your, in your sleeping bag and you're sitting there saying, oh my God, am I seeing aliens? And so, so sometimes that confused me with was I dreaming or was I really seeing this, this light or not? But I, I dreamt the same that I did on the ground in space. I, I can second that with the, uh, the because you see these flashes as these particles go through. So sometimes you get just one that would come diagonal. Another times you get one that would go through both eyes. And so you could kind of get a sense of, of you know, the directions that the, the particles uh, traveled. I had fairly normal dreams in space. They weren't that exciting. For me, the interesting part was when I came back and a few weeks after I got back from space, I would always dream of floating. Uh, yep. Whereas I'd be in my house and I just want to get to the top floor and I would just float up the staircase or go over top of the rail rather than uh, <laughs> and climb up. So those are always the more the better news I had when after I got back from space. That sounds like a pretty excellent dream. Yeah. One last question here in the auditorium. Hi, um, I'm Christina. I'm from DC. Uh, I'm an early career woman scientist, um, and so I wanted to ask about education and outreach specifically. Uh, I always noticed the very strong lack of, of women, and especially in um, the physical sciences and especially in the you know, post-PhD or PhD level work. So I was wondering if, you guys, if NASA has outreach to sort of maintain the interest that especially young children and, and young girls may have when they're younger but may not progress through the college or postgraduate um, levels. So in, in our education programs, we focus on diversity in everything that we do. And underrepresented, underserved in the engineering and sciences definitely involves women. So Rebecca Kaiser and a number of people uh, at the agency are focused on this. And we have a group that's working with the uh, White House Council for Women and Girls, 
We have a women.nasa.gov website that actually targets middle school girls to see themselves in careers as scientists and engineers. And if you go to that women.nasa.gov site, you will see women talking about how they came through from childhood all the way up to becoming a scientist or engineer and the obstacles that they had and the people that said you can't do that. And there's one woman in particular that's not on the site, but Katherine Johnson, was a, she's a 95-year-old, uh, uh, was former NASA Langley uh, mathematician who they call the human computer because she computed uh, the first capsules going into space the orbital mechanics. And so when the computers came online, they, the astronauts would ask her to double check the computers because she was so good. But when she first started working, they didn't have a bathroom for her to go to. You know, they, they made jokes, they laughed, but she persevered and became one of the most preeminent you know, mathematicians at NASA. So using role models, using these types of websites, using an awareness and having you know, the administration focusing on these types of activities is very important. And we, we have a, a very strong, strong area in that. So definitely check it out, women.nasa.gov. Thank you, great question. So we have to wrap up this panel um, right now because we're running a little bit behind schedule. But um, I, do, I did notice a lot of hands are still up and we've got a lot of questions. Um, definitely stay tuned on NASA.gov and NASA TV. We've got a lot of really great um, opportunities to interact with astronauts on the space station. We're going to do a Google Plus Hangout live from space in a couple of weeks. It's going to be great. So save your questions for, for that time and keep them coming on social media. I think it's time to uh, go to our next panel. Thank you. is away.
How many in the audience witnessed the landing of Mars Curiosity rover on the Red Planet? Show of hands. Which I always found really, I always find that really spectacular when you consider the time of day the landing occurred, right? It was like 1.30 a.m. Eastern time, I think, when it was verified. It just shows you the passion people have for extraordinary things. I mean, this was something unique and incredible in engineering feat, and people were tuned in on the edge of their seat. And it just shows you, it's a testament what we can do as humans. When we put our mind to something and work together, we can accomplish great things like landing on the red planet. Curiosity captured our imagination, but it's only one of many ongoing future missions to Mars that'll pave the way for humans to one day go to the red planet. Our moderator, Shana Valley, uh, from the Office of Legis Legislative and Intergovernment Affairs will introduce our panel of Mars experts. For those not in the audience who have questions, you can tweet using the hashtag AskNASA. You can also follow on Ustream and YouTube and NASA television, nasa.gov slash NTV, uh, and ask questions on Google+. Uh, before we get started, uh, we have another video for you uh, on Mars. Things are looking good. Coming up on entry. The able reports entry interface. At this time, it will begin pressurizing the propulsion system to increase the thrust of the system. Uh, we'll use that for all the maneuvering in the atmosphere we're about to do. We are standing by for guidance start, the start of guided entry. We are beginning to feel the atmosphere as we go in here. The vehicle has just reported via tones that it has started guided entry. At this time, the vehicle is beginning to steer its way to the target. We have seen peak deceleration. That is starting its first bank reversal. Uh, it is reporting that we are seeing G's on the order of uh, 11 to 12 Earth G's. Bank reversal 2 is starting. We are now getting telemetry from Odyssey. We should have parachute deploy around Mach 1.7. Parachute is deployed. We are decelerating. Feet chill step has separated where we found the ground. We're down to 90 meters per second at an altitude of 6.5 kilometers per second. Standing by for back shell separation. We are in powered flight. We're at altitude of one kilometer descending. Standing by for sky crane. Sky crane is started. Single to us, you remain strong. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. <laughs> again for being here today. I remember where I was when Curiosity landed. I was in my apartment in the middle of the night, jumping up and down and screaming, probably waking up my neighbors. 
Um, so I'm very excited to be with this panel of uh, Mars experts today. Um, first up, um, speaking to you guys, will be uh, Dr. Michael Meyer. He's the lead program scientist for the Mars Exploration Program here at headquarters. He oversees the program Science Operations and Planning. He's also a program scientist for the Mars Science Laboratory mission. Previously, he was NASA's senior scientist for astrobiology and a program scientist for the 2001 Mars Odyssey mission. Uh, next up, we'll have uh, Dr. Ashwin Vas Vasavada, uh, the Mars uh, Science Laboratory Deputy Project Scientist. He's from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory out in Pasadena, California. Uh, he has his PhD in planetary science from Caltech, and his research interests include studies of Martian geology and atmospheric dynamics. Following him, we'll hear from Dr. Jim Green. He's the director of the Planetary Science Division, also at headquarters. Uh, he's, he oversees programs across uh, the solar system. He's worked for many years at NASA at the Marshall and Goddard Space Flight Centers, and he's written many scientific and technical papers uh, on magnetospheres and data systems. And last but certainly not least, we'll hear from Dr. John Grunsfeld, our Associate Administrator for Science, for the Science Mission Directorate here at headquarters. Uh, he previously served as the Deputy Director of the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, uh, where he oversaw the Hubble and uh, future James Webb Space Telescope programs. Uh, he's also a scientist by training. He's done his research in astrophysics and exoplanetary studies. And he also, uh, as you can tell by the blue suit, is an astronaut uh, starting in 1992. He has flown on five shuttle flights including three visits to the Hubble, where he did an excellent job doing some repair work. So also a great handyman. <laughs> um, so now we'll just, uh, I'll start with, with Michael here and he'll tell us a little bit more. Yeah, uh, well this is great. Uh, glad to see everybody here. I, I really don't like watching that video because it just, it chokes me up every time. And uh, it really was a great culmination of over 10 years of effort of coming up with what would be the right rover to send to Mars and what instruments should be on it and then actually getting it built is a real challenge. But it was well worth it. Uh, the, we, had a Mar we have a Mars exploration program and because of the assets that we have had orbiting Mars and still orbiting Mars now and also things on the surface like the Mars exploration rovers, We've been able to set things up that we could send this highly capable rover to the surface of Mars to a place where we see geology and minerals that tell us that water has been there for a significant period of time. And so we've sent a rover highly equipped to explore Gale Crater. And part of the reason for our attraction to Gale Crater is because it's a crater, it could hold water. Uh, but it has a mountain in the middle of it, Mount Sharp of over five kilometers high, but we see layering. And with the layers, each of the layers, we can see certain minerals like sulfates and other minerals like clays associated with the layers. And by going there and exploring, we can actually go through a period of Mars where it went through the transition from being a warmer and wetter planet to drying out to becoming the cold and somewhat dry and acidic planet that we see today. So this is a tremendous, opportunity to cover a major transition in Mars history, hopefully from a time when it might have been habitable, able to support microbial life. So we went to Gale Crater, full of hope and expectation because of what everything that we knew. And amazingly enough, well, it worked, it landed. <laughs> uh, that's tremendous in itself. But within the first two months of exploration, we came across a bedrock of what we call conglomerates. We see rocks that are rounded pebbles, they're glued together. We see those here on Earth only in riverbeds. So we landed in a place, we're expecting to find some evidence of water, a place that could have been occupied by micro microbial life, and we find almost right off the bat what looks like ancient riverbed. This is very, very, very promising. And with that, we decided to go, instead of toward Mount Sharp, where all these layers are that we spotted from orbit, we decided to go downhill, water flows downhill, to a place called Yellowknife Bay. 
And that's where the rover is today. We're seeing a pan of Yellowknife Bay right there. We see rocks that look like water has been there for an extended period of time. We see cross bedding, which tells you that there's been a flow regime there and then rocks cemented together. We see minerals like sulfate, so similar to gypsum, in veins in the rock, so we know that water has flowed through the cracks and left this mineral. And in the coming week or so, when we finally pick the perfect rock, or almost perfect rock, we're gonna start drilling, and we have some very high hopes of what we're actually gonna find in this area. It's very promising and we'll see how it evolves, but we certainly have amazing capability of this rover to explore Mars for us. And with that, I'll stop my comments because we're gonna have an extensive question period and uh, turn it over to Ashwin. Hi, uh, I'm here from Pasadena at the JPL and uh, tell you a little about what it's been like to be involved in this mission uh, from almost the start. Uh, I started in about 2004, so about nine years ago, working on this rover, and the rover mission itself started maybe a year or two before that in its definition stage. Uh, for me, uh, even before I started working on Curiosity, the thing that really uh, I love about planetary science, uh, well, when I was 10, I just loved the fact that we can send spacecraft and land on other planets. But when I got older and went to grad school, uh, what really attracted me was that we have four and a half billion years of history. Uh, out in the solar system and things have changed remarkably over time and uh, not only on Earth but on planets like Mars. Mars has a rich history. It went through major transitions of its climate. It used to be a warmer and wetter planet. Something has dramatically changed to make it the place it is today and the chance to, to unlock that was something I, I couldn't turn down. Fortunately, uh, JPL in 2004 was running the Mars exploration rovers and, and getting ready for a Mars reconnaissance orbit and running Odyssey and all, all this stuff was happening and they were sort of short on Mars scientists. So I got recruited there fortunately and it was the best, uh, you know, best email I ever got uh, to, to, uh, to apply for the job that I, I have been in for the last decade. Uh, but to, to kind of realize my scientific dream of uh, being involved in this rover which was specifically designed to figure out uh, that ancient time period on Mars when it could have been a potentially habitable place. And, and even if you know, Mars didn't have life, we sort of hope it, you know, it, it's exciting that way. But if it, if it didn't, it's still, there's that incredible story of change over time and all the lessons we can learn and even apply to understanding our, our, our own climate on Earth. Uh, so you know, when I got to JPL, um, we got our sort of one pager from NASA headquarters saying these are, you know, from Michael, uh, <laughs> saying <laughs> these are your goals, uh, you know, here are the bullet points, this is the goal of the mission, now build it. And, and so, you know, the, the challenge of working with the engineering team, which was almost a thousand people at times uh, at JPL uh, and all of us scientists alongside, was to figure out uh, the right platform, the right experiments, the right landing site, and all those just involved so much uh, effort by so many people that brought so much skill and talent to figuring out exactly you know that this was the right vehicle uh, that you needed to um, put a big mass spectrometer about the size of a, of a large microwave oven but that would normally fill an entire room at a laboratory so the ambition of what was tried to be what was successfully done on this rover is amazing you know you go to NASA Goddard and you see a room that contains all kinds of pipes and ovens and valves and everything else that does these high caliber experiments that we're trying to do on Mars and say, so when we want to shrink that down to about this big, then put it on a rover that drives around and shakes it in you know, an extreme environment on Mars and then do that 75 times without ever adjusting the instrument. You know, once you launch it, you can't ever turn any screws anymore or fix anything. Um, that alone was amazing. And then we saw what the engineers came up to land the thing. And that, of course, scared the heck out of us, <laughs> um, all the way up till August 5th at you know, <laughs> 1:29 p.m. or a.m. or whatever. <laughs> uh, so, uh, you know, it just has been an incredible ride. Uh, then we had to pick the landing site. So we were fortunately benefiting from this great Mars program where we had reconnaissance satellites for more than a decade mapping Mars extensively and allowing us, again, to realize this dream of not having to pick the, the, the easy spots on Mars, but to pick somewhere that would best accomplish our science, even though it's a challenging area. We landed next to a three mile high mountain. You know, that, that's pretty spectacular. Uh, we couldn't do that with any mission prior to Curiosity because of the new landing system. 
uh, and you know, using the wheels as landing gear. That's like out of the box, you know? That's, that was pretty cool. Uh, but they're still working, so that's good too. Uh, so you know, here we are, we're six months into the mission almost, and uh, already making um, discoveries that we didn't expect from orbit, but more importantly, you know, making the discoveries that we hoped for. Uh, everything we hoped about Gale Crater is, is coming true. Uh, and that's really because of all the work that's been done before to help pick this landing site and help design this rover with this payload. So we can't wait for what the next months bring. Jim. All right. Mm -hmm. well, thank you very much. First thing I want to do, of course, is uh, welcome you to NASA headquarters. What you may not realize is this is the building where it all starts. We're currently planning our future, and, and JPL and our other centers are very much involved in implementing it, but it all starts here. And I want to talk about not only a little bit about the last 10 years of Mars, but the future, the start of that future of Mars, and, and, and uh, in the long run, um, our ultimate destinations as humans consider going to Mars. Over the last 10 years, the program that we put in place has been follow the water. We always felt that Mars at one time in its history had water. And of course, water is an important ingredient for life. We can't imagine right now what life would be like in, in another environment if, if water wasn't there. And we wanted to see if, if Mars uh, still had water and what its past history was. And so that program, starting uh, 10 years ago with our initial orbiters that looked at the mineralogy from orbit, uh, to our high-resolution orbiters like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, giving us uh, 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 the ability to look at this table if it was sitting on Mars from orbit and allowing us to pick those great landing sites. Those have not disappointed us. They've allowed us to pick those places that Spirit and Opportunity went. And, and of course, this is a wheel uh, from the Spirit and Opportunity rovers. Spirit is no longer operating, as you know, but, but Opportunity is doing great and looking at places where uh, water has been and in fact everywhere we look there's some sort of signs of water and that has really spurred us on to this next decade and we've planned out this next decade it's an exciting decade of Mars missions and it's all about seeking signs of life all right we know that Mars had a, a, a fabulous environment in its past many billions of years ago that allowed it to have a significant amount of water. And what we see from orbit also gives us indications that a lot of the water has gone underground. And, and perhaps there's uh, life on Mars today in a microbial form. The, the plan that we have uh, starts this year with the launch of a spacecraft called MAVEN. Now, MAVEN is an orbiter. It'll get it, it launches in uh, November of uh, this year. It, it, it will get into orbit in September of 2014, next year, and it's all about looking at Mars relative to what the solar wind does. Now, Mars used to have a magnetic field, and we believe that magnetic field is stronger than the one we he have here on Earth. And our magnetic field has really protected us a lot from erosion, or upper atmosphere erosion uh, by the solar wind. Maven's going to going to take a good look at the processes that strip away the lighter elements that have popped to the top of the atmosphere and into the ionosphere and what those processes are and what's happened to Mars over the many billions of years. Perhaps we'll find an answer as to why it's so arid now uh, and it will be that start of, um, of, of the seeking signs of life. The next mission, the next opportunity we have is in 26 months. You know, going to Mars is really like the Super Bowl. Not only uh, landing things is pretty spectacular when you make that touchdown, but it's really all about throwing the ball and getting a receiver down field and having them catch it. That launching a launching spacecraft from Earth and getting them to Mars is all about. We have to launch before Mars gets to a particular point, and it takes every 26 months for that alignment to occur. So we have a plan now for which about every uh, 26 months for the 10 years, for the next 10 years, we're gonna be involved in, in Mars missions. And as I mentioned, in, in 13 we'll be launching MAVEN. The next opportunity turns out to be in, in uh, 16, 2016. 
Now, uh, NASA is involved in an ESA mission. It's called uh, the Trace Gas Orbiter. And it will be inserted in orbit and it will look at trace gases. Now, what are trace gases? Those are any, any gases that are at a very small amounts uh, that it may find in its atmosphere. Uh, things like argon, uh, uh, nitrogen, is there's not a lot of nitrogen, uh, that, that might be a trace gas. But one trace gas that we're after is methane. And of course, methane can be generated biologically. I know cows on this earth generate more methane than anything else, so we don't expect to find any cows, of course. But uh, termites. And, uh, perhaps, uh, termites. termites, termites generate methane, a lot of methane, you're right. Uh, and indeed, um, it, but it also can be generated uh, abiotically, deep in Mars, if there's magma, if there's water, we know there's water in the underground, and minerals, uh, the interactions of those generate methane, they leak out, and we want to see where these methane vents are. We want to get an indication of, is Mars an active planet? And in addition to uh, participating with the ESA mission in 2016, we're going to put a lander down on Mars. This is going to be uh, like Phoenix. Instead of going to the pole, it's actually going to go in the equatorial region. And it will have a seismometer on it and a heat flow probe. And we're going to look at how active Mars is as a planet itself. You know, does it have, how big is its core? How big is its mantle? How big is its crust? How is it put together? and get, for the first time, a view of the inside of Mars from a seismic perspective. You know, that's how we understand what the, what the structure of the Earth looks like. And this will be the next best thing that we can do to make comparisons between our Earth and Mars, and therefore understand its history and how it's evolved. Tremendously exciting mission. It's called InSight. Now, the next opportunity after that's in 2018, and ESA, is uh, uh, launching a mission, it's a rover, it's called ExoMars, and we're participating in that. Uh, we have a number of things that we're working with them. We'll be uh, uh, consulting with them on entry, descent, and landing. We want to make sure that's successful that for them also. And this particular uh, rover uh, will be the very first for ESA, and it will be doing uh, molecular, uh, uh, biomolecular analysis of all sorts, and it's a very exciting mission. But our top mission that we recently announced is the one after that, the end of the decade. It's the Mars 2020 rover. It's going to be based very much on Curiosity's uh, uh, success in terms of how it got to the surface. You know, putting one ton on the surface is pretty hard to do. As you can see, the sky crane has worked tremendously successful for us. So we'll be building a very similar system. However, the insides will be very, very different. And then, indeed, we'll be all about looking, seeking the signs of life. We've just put together a science definition team to help us decide what measurements we need to make. And then from that, we'll determine what instruments. We'll have a call out to the community to help build those instruments. We expect a lot of international participation. And that whole rover mission will, will come together from a concept point of view over the next year as we move forward to, uh, I believe, another tremendous decade of successful Science Mars missions. And with that, John, tell us about the next future. Well, Mars isn't the only planet in the solar system, of course. Uh, there's another rarely visited planet called Earth, and, uh, and we all live on that planet. And on Earth, we also seek water, especially while we're talking up on stage. And water is really critical for life. And so we have a search for places in the solar system uh, where we might find life. And right now, you know, Mars is a big focus. Of course, we have a spacecraft, the Messenger spacecraft at Mercury. We have uh, spacecraft all around the Earth learning about our climate, our weather, and, and, and processes on Earth. Of course, Mars, we're, we've sent Juno on its way to Jupiter uh, beyond the asteroid belt. Uh, and we have a spacecraft heading out New Horizons towards Pluto. Now, of course, Pluto is not a planet, right? Right. <laughs> okay. So, so we really do a lot of exploration. So why, why is Mars so fascinating? You know, why are we putting all this effort? Why did we order the special 17-inch tires <laughs> to put on, on the rover uh, to send Curiosity? Such a large rover, you know, really very special, incredible system. Uh, big enough that if you put a seat on it and a steering wheel, somebody could drive around on it. Uh, and it is just that, because uh, Mars is very much like Earth. You know, it may have been even more like Earth two and a half billion, three billion years ago, a warm, wet, 
habitable place. Um, and now Mars, especially Gale Crater, you know, the, the warm daytime temperature is, you know, just a little bit above freezing. You know, pretty comfortable, but at, at night it gets really cold. You know, minus 60, minus 70 C. Uh, personally, uh, in my spare time, I like to go climb mountains, rock and ice, where it gets down to maybe minus 40 or minus 50 C. And I get to put on a big backpack and heavy clothes and, uh, and try and survive. And that really is the next step for humans. Even though we live in a solar system of riches, a variety of planets from Mercury that we're just beginning to understand, you know, to the beautiful rings of Saturn, uh, there's really only one planet in our solar system that we could live on uh, besides the Earth. Um, and I still am wondering, is the Earth habitable? Uh, that's a long-term question. Um, the question of Mars is, was it ever habitable? And is it habitable today potentially for us? And so even on the Curiosity rover and on Spirit and Opportunity before that, we put experiments, radiation experiments, uh, and, and we have a weather station on the Curiosity rover uh, provided by Spain, you know, that will help start the path of sending humans to Mars. Uh, that's been a dream probably as long as people you know, have thought about Mars as a planet, certainly since the early days of the space age. That was uh, Werner von Braun's uh, dream. Uh, and has been part of our space lore and space program uh, since the beginning of the space program. And we're getting inch by inch closer, or should I say centimeter by centimeter, uh, closer with actually a certain leaps. And the, and the Curiosity rover is one of those. MAVEN will get us the next step in the Mars 2020 rover and our ExoMars participation even closer uh, to the point that maybe we can, in not too distant future, have a scientific expedition, geologists and astrobiologists, uh, to go to Mars, put our boots on the ground, and actually explore and use our human knowledge uh, to be able to make much rap more rapid progress and find out, you know, is Mars a place that we uh, will someday live? We're building a space launch system, a very big heavy lift rocket that will be able to get, you know, the habitats and the equipment we'll need uh, in that time frame. And in fact, I see a young lady in the, in the second row here uh, and maybe she'll be our first Mars explorer. What do you think? Would you want to go to Mars? Her little sister does. Your little sister. Uh, okay, you want to, I understand, you want to send your sister to Mars. I totally understand that. So, so you know, all of this is part, you know, of a really grand uh, adventure, a grand scientific uh, adventure seeking, you know, knowledge about Mars. and and. From what you've heard today and what you probably know about this ancient wet Mars and this dry Mars today, don't listen to them. Mars is a wet place today. It's just not on the surface anymore, other than the poles. Mm -hmm. We actually know there's a lot of water on Mars. And that's a great thing. And, and uh, Jim Green mentioned trace gases. There's nitrogen on Mars. Well, actually, we need nitrogen because nitrogen is something that if we ever want to plant plants on Mars, they're going to need for fertilizer. If there was no nitrogen, we'd either have to extract it from the rocks, which would be trace, or bring it ourselves. Well, that's very hard. Uh, there's carbon dioxide, which means there's both carbon and oxygen. You know, we need oxygen to breathe. And of course, water, you know, you split water, electrolysis, you get hydrogen and oxygen. You can breathe the oxygen, use the hydrogen for fuel. Oh, yeah, hydrogen and oxygen. That's what powered the space shuttle. We have rocket fuel on Mars in the Martian atmosphere. Uh, so the, you know, it's a really exciting place. We're making the first steps. Uh, the Mars 2020 lander is going to be a great opportunity that will have both science instruments and space technology uh, that might lead towards human missions. So I think we have a very exciting program. Uh, I'm excited. I wish I could go. Uh, but if you want to send your sister, I think that's okay, too. <laughs> so I think with that, I'll turn it back to Shannon. All right. Thanks, you all. That was uh, fabulous. I'm really excited about the next 10 years and beyond, and I'm sure that you guys are as well. Um, now we're going to do the, the question and answer period. So we'll have the mics coming around. Raise your hands uh, for, to, to get called upon. And if you can, uh, please state your name and also where you're from. Um, and after that, we'll go over to social media. So. Got our first one from the web right now. So from Twitter. Um, what do the constellations look like on Mars? Is it possible to use the stars for navigation the same way we do here? 
Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So the, the stars um, are so much further away than either Earth or Mars that um, they look pretty much the same from Mars. And in fact, we do use the stars for navigation. Uh, we use our star, <laughs> we use the sun for navigation uh, for the rover to find Earth. So um, one thing we do is the, uh, we use the cameras on Curiosity on its head to search for the sun. Uh, if we ever lose the, sort of the, where the, the rover thinks it's at, it can find the sun and then steer its antenna to find Earth because on board it has the, the map of the stars and, and where Earth should be. Uh, we also have taken um, pictures of Martian moons, Phobos and Deimos, with our cameras on the surface. And so the rover computer actually has some pretty neat uh, ast astronomy maps uh, in its memory. And, and certainly um, star finders on the crew stage were used as part of the navigation, making sure that we're pointed toward Mars when we're going there. I will say there's one fundamental difference, though. Mm -hmm. Maybe Jim was going to yeah, go there, too. Probably right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when you go out at night and you look in the night yeah. sky and you see bright stars, you know, some of those are not actually stars, right. especially at, right now at night if you go out and you look, you'll see Jupiter pretty much overhead, really bright. Not a star, but a planet. And, uh, you know, I often go out and I try and look for the reddish, steady, bright object, which is Mars. And uh, if, if you look at the constellations here on Earth at night, and if you were standing on Mars and looking up in the night sky, the constellations would all be familiar because they're so far away. They would look almost identical. Uh, you really, humans would not be able to tell the difference. But there's one difference. Yeah. When you look up and you'd see Jupiter and you'd see Saturn, you know, these bright objects in the sky would be really cool. And there'd be one that looks very unfamiliar slight bluish tint, uh, steady, so you know it's a planet, and that's Earth, uh, and that's a very cool thing. That would be our morning star. That would be, yep, yeah, our, that's morning, our star. morning star. Well, that's right, it right. would be like Venus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That we see from Earth, right. Got our second question right here in the front. Jeff Wallace, uh, Rocketman529 on Twitter. So share with us, you know, we've heard all about the successes, but what were, say, maybe the three biggest uh, pieces of science that had to be invented or challenges uh, in making it all happen? Specific things. Oh, that's uh, a difficult question because there are a fair number of challenges. On, on the science end, uh, Oshwin uh, alluded to it in talking about getting uh, a gas chromatograph mass spec from lab size to, to uh, microwave size. Uh, one of the thing, one of the other instruments, Kemen, was a real challenge. This is this is a uh, X-ray diffraction, X-ray fluorescent instrument. It's, a, it's used for doing telling you about mineralogy. Um, that fits in kind of a fume hood size, and that had to be shrunk down to fit inside the rover. And it's kind of interesting because I knew about this instrument all along as it was kind of coming up through the ranks and getting funding for development, and I thought it was going to be probably the easiest instrument to build because I knew that it had been funded for, for a decade and getting ready for space flight. Well, as soon as it was picked for space flight, there are, all of a sudden you find the things that aren't going to work when you try to send it to space. So it was one of those, uh, it really had to be revamped, even though we thought we had a pretty good instrument to start with. So that, that was one of the other things. Um, Just mentioned one yeah. more, uh, which is um, uh, related to science. Uh, you know, we have these wonderful sample analysis instruments. The, the whole point of MSL was to acquire samples of rock and soil. And we've done soil before on other missions. We've never done rock. and to, to drill, I mean, to get rock samples, you need a drill. Yeah. And then you need to uh, process that material and sieve it and portion it. And this was a whole brand new invention that uh, NASA and JPL had to come up with. And so, you know, you can just imagine, like I said before, um, it's easy to do that sort of, um, you know, you can take your drill out to the field you, and pound into some rocks, but it's something, something that's stuck or something get clogged. And on Earth, you can deal with all that. On Mars, it has to work every time. 75 times in a row based on the specs for the mission. And that was a real challenge to develop a, a working drill and sample system. And, and we've, we've tested this scoop. We've processed samples with it. We've gotten our first results. We're about to do the drilling in a couple weeks. Yeah, and, and one other aspect is there are over 400 scientists and 10 instruments on this thing. So you can imagine the amount of effort that goes into making a decision every day about what you're going to do. <laughs>
you know, when we develop missions, uh, we have a rule of thumb, and that is only one miracle a mission. You know? <laughs> uh, and and uh, when we got involved with um, uh, what we needed to do to put one ton down on the ground, the, the engineering challenges were enormous, and it just seemed like we were stacking up the miracles. Um, but um, it, it really gives us these kind of missions, that challenge, uh, to give it to our young engineers that don't understand what's impossible, and they make it possible. Um, that's what's really, truly amazing about the missions that NASA does. All right, our next one up here. Hi, I'm Aiden. This is my fourth question to social. <laughs> Good. <laughs> my question is, why do people want to go to Mars? Do you? <laughs> Would you like to go to Mars? No. So there's a, there's a lot of reasons people would like to go to Mars. I'll you know I'll pick on uh, John Grabsoner, who's the, the the project scientist. Um, he's a geologist. He likes to go out in the field with a rock hammer and a collection bag, and and to go out and try and find out you know what makes the Earth work. Uh, you know why do we see certain minerals in some places and certain in others? Um, as a kid growing up, I I like to look for fossils. You know, and we want to go on Mars and look for fossils. And we've sent this amazingly capable rover uh, to Mars, and it's got a two-year mission, one Martian year, two Earth years, to try and drive around to the most interesting places. And of course, there's 400 scientists that all think right where they are now or two or three feet away is the most interesting place, so it's slow progress. But, uh, but we want to get up to Mark, Mount Sharp. We want to drill you know, where we are now, but there's lots of other places we want to go. And the rover is really slow. Um, we, one of the spots that we've targeted is about seven kilometers away, and it may take us a year to get there. John Gratzinger would have been there the first afternoon. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe even quicker, because you can run really fast on Mars, because it has less gravity. And so people want to go to Mars to get our human eyeballs, our human brains, and to explore. You know, one of the reasons we're so successful as a species on Earth is because we have this driving curiosity, this need to explore. And if we want to make much faster scientific progress, and if we want to find out, can we live on Mars? Can we put a, someday a Mars colony and actually have another place in the solar system to live? Uh, you know, that's why people want to go. It's, you know, it's kind of like you know, the early pioneers in the US. You know, they left you know, the East Coast to head west to explore, to find out what's there. And was it risky and dangerous? You bet it was. Lots of people lost their lives going out to explore. And not just the Lewis and Clarks, you know, the, the real traditional explorers, P just families in covered wagons trying to find a new life. And uh, it's just fascinating that this is a time in history where that kind of exploration is on the cusp of leaving the Earth and going out and finding places to explore. Our first wave, though, now is a technology wave. It's curiosity, taking our curiosity with it uh, to help us explore on Mars. But ultimately, the Curiosity rover isn't going to discover anything. You know, it's people here on Earth, like folks on the stage here, or some of you in the audience. You know, we're the people that discover. And it's much more powerful when we can take, you know, our tools and our intelligence on site to do that exploration. Uh, famous underwater explorer, oceanographer, Sylvia Earles, you know, is often asked, you know, why did she want to go to the bottom of the ocean? You know, we could send robots. You know, but she, she risked her life uh, to go in this you know, small pressurized can that could have been crushed with all that pressure to go to the bottom of the ocean. And then she said because you know, she wanted to see it with her eyes, to experience it with her eyes. Uh, and it makes a difference. The human perspective makes a big difference and really pushes discovery. From my perspective, what we're looking at right now are images of Mars. Some of them have been colored, which makes them really beautiful to look at. But each and every one of them are absolutely stunning. The, you know, we, when we go explore the majestic mountains and the beautiful rivers and the things that we see on this planet are so inspiring. And, and we've only covered a few percent of the surface at these high resolution images. And they are absolutely astounding. If you've seen the Grand Canyon, I've got news for you. There's a canyon on Mars that could stretch across the United States if it was on this planet. 
And so these are absolutely fabulous vistas that we're looking at. And, and John's right, uh, Americans have this explorer gene. That's why we're here, I think. That's what, what's been passed down to us. And it's just so tempting. And I think it's important. I think the ultimate fate of our civilization for it to survive is to be able to be knowledgeable about our solar system, what it contains as resources, and how we will move from one planet to the next. Thanks, that was another great question from Aiden. Keep them coming for sure. Um, next one back there. Um, hi, I'm Andrew Frankel, originally from New Jersey. Um, so I think going to Mars is definitely a good goal, but I've heard from a lot of astronomers that first we should focus on going back to the moon once as kind of a test run sort of thing. What's your opinion on the importance of perhaps going back to the moon before going to Mars and how the logistics of that would work out? So that's, uh, that's, that's a very difficult question. Uh, going to the moon is hard. Going to Mars is even harder. Uh, you know, I've mentioned that I like to do mountain climbing, and I didn't start on the hardest mountains I could find. You know, I started on little cliffs in Wisconsin, actually, learning how to rock climb, uh, and going out in winter, and then climbing in the Rockies, and then the West Coast, and eventually made it to Alaska and South America, uh, you know, building up skills. And so what we're doing now is, you know, we have a, a wealth of experience from our Apollo program. We have a wealth of experience from Skylab and the space shuttle program, learning how to live and work in space. We have astronauts on the International Space Station right now. They're learning about, and you heard in a previous panel, how we can live in space for much longer periods of time. The moon missions were very short. Uh, now we're, we've got uh, crew members spending six months in space. We'll have uh, Scott Kelly, who will spend a year in space with his fellow cosmonaut uh, coming up in a few years, starting to learn about the duration of missions that would be to Mars. You know, about the shortest Mars mission you could do would be one year round trip. That would be a sprint equivalent to, you know, our Apollo 8. Um, I think, do we ne would we need to go back uh, to the moon in order to be successful going to Mars? I don't think so. I think we're smart enough now, we have enough technology, and we're building on that technology and medical knowledge that we could go to Mars. Um, but it's probably going to take about 10 years to 20 years to build up the actual equipment and the technological base to be able to go there. Uh, so that's a decision that uh, you know, multiple Congresses, multiple presidents will have to make. What we're trying to do is to make sure that we retain the capability uh, to go further, to push our boundaries, leave low Earth orbit in a few years, uh, and have the option to go to the moon, to Mars, to asteroids, you know, wherever it happens to be. And so we're building up that core capability now. Uh, and in the meantime, learning as much as we can about Mars about past habitability and current habitability uh, to, you know, to be ready. From a science perspective, the moon is incredibly important to us. You know, as, a, as the head of the Planetary Science Division, we have missions that are uh, orbiting the moon right now. And we're, we're finding great, uh, great things about uh, the importance that the moon plays uh, in, in perhaps preserving life here on Earth over its history. Uh, the bombardment history of the entire moon earth system uh, all that is uh, is there for us to read so from a scientific perspective the moon is really very important uh, and we're continuing to have opportunities in the future for missions to go to the moon and we should mention we're going to launch the laddie mission this oh, yeah. year laddie is oh thank you yes laddie this year mm -hmm. late summer mm -hmm. yeah. stay tuned i believe we have a question from social media now so a question off twitter uh, how can you make sure the gases you find on Mars aren't from man-made objects in orbit or on Mars from past missions? You're the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, we, we spend uh, many, we've had many sleepless nights worrying about uh, questions like that. Um, it turns out that the gases that we're worried about uh, confusing us when we're trying to interpret the gases on Mars aren't necessarily from past missions or... Um, I can't remember what the other thing was, but more that um, they're from our own spacecraft. Uh, so um, you've probably seen pictures of Curiosity being built and all the people wearing those, what we call the bunny suits. Uh, so every piece of Curiosity was either baked in an oven to, to make sure there was no living organisms on it and all the gases from the materials had escaped uh, from those parts, or they were assembled in these really uh, 
clean environments, in these clean rooms at different institutions, including the final assembly at JPL, where no human hand uh, has ever touched um, curiosity or any part of it uh, after, unless it was you know, cleaned extremely well afterwards. So we sent this very clean spacecraft, but even then, we're trying to detect uh, methane, for example, on Mars, where methane is only one molecule in a billion. <laughs> so one part per billion of the Martian, uh, of the little air that we suck into the instrument, uh, one molecule of a billion molecules would be methane, and that's the level we need to detect it to figure out the kind of questions that, um, about methane being related to life or not and, and those sorts of things. So it's been tough. And in fact, we've run our atmospheric experiment a few times in a row, each time getting smarter about how we uh, get all the Earth gases that we brought with us out of the instrument and make sure we're measuring Mars. Right. And it's a, it's, a, it's a challenge, but the fact that we are getting uh, really good, clean results from Mars is a testament to all those technicians and all the scientists and engineers who've worked to develop these instruments. Mm -hmm. I'll just add to that that, in fact, you know, and you can elaborate on this. They brought Florida air with them, yeah. <laughs> uh, and in you know one of the chambers, and it's been very useful because it's a calibration source mm -hmm. to make sure that eventually, when we get uh, the Martian samples that indicate interesting things, we can say ah, and we can calibrate that against what we know here on Earth. Uh, yeah, that that was moist, moist, yeah, humid Florida air. Right, right. <laughs> what had happened, and and this is one of our slightly embarrassing moments, was. Uh, some of that Florida air, which we brought on purpose to calibrate. Uh, so we look at the Florida air, and we know what gases are in that air. And therefore, we can use that to, as a reference against what we're trying to discover on Mars. But some of that Florida air had leaked into the instrument. So the very first time we tried to detect methane on Mars, there was you know, hoots and hollers from Goddard saying, well, tons of methane on Mars. And then, oh, it's actually uh, looks a lot like the same concentration we find in Florida. Uh, and then they realized what was happening. And we sort of corrected that experiment after that. Uh, but that's space exploration. Yeah, Curious <laughs> launched from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, yeah. uh, Cape Canaveral, so uh, that's why it had Florida air. Hey, I'm Mike Smith from uh, Woodbridge, Virginia, and uh, I was just wondering if, I know that uh, the mission has been very successful so far, but is there anything with Curiosity that you wish you could go back and change now, uh, something that wasn't quite right? The scientists will be uh, better to answer that. <laughs> well, it's an interesting question. Uh, personally, uh, one of the things I would have liked to have had is uh, when the SAM instrument, the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, was proposed, it also had a, a laser desorption aspect to it that was de-scoped, just so we could get everything to fit and, and affordable. And, uh, I would have liked to have had that because then you can you can uh, feed samples into the gas chromatograph uh, off the surface of a rock. Uh, it's interesting enough. We, this is an important enough instrument that it is now going to go on the ExoMars mission that's being sent in 2018. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing that was not quite ready for prime time when we're selecting instruments in 2004, but it's now going to go on the next uh, rover mission being sent to Mars. All right, a question in the back. Hello, my name is Ronnie Bailey. Um, I'm from Richmond, Virginia. My question is, because there is so much data available for the public, what is the most interesting thing that somebody from, that's a citizen has spotted, or, mm. you know, something like that from a citizen has spotted? You know, it's, it's fantastic yeah. that, um, we live in the age of the internet. <laughs> Planetary exploration sort of appeared before the internet, but now all these um, missions, uh, we put all the images online immediately. Um, and in fact, we're so busy just operating the spacecraft that many times uh, the, the public, especially certain groups that immediately look at all the images and make mosaics and, and search them, they do that long before we even get the chance to. <laughs> so, you know, I shouldn't admit this, but a lot of us like read those websites and, you know, <laughs> and see what's being discovered out there by the public. And it's great. Uh, one of the funnier things was um, the, uh, the, the little bits of what we think are plastic uh, that was covering some wires. Um, people started spotting these little pieces of obviously not Martian stuff um, uh, all over the ground at, at, at the site where we landed. And it took us a while 
uh, to realize that there were probably little bits that either came from um, wiring in the spacecraft, you know, ex in an expected way, not in a bad way, uh, or from the parachute when it deployed and spread out a lot of debris. Uh, so just trying to figure that out. But that's the kind of stuff that the public catches really well. Okay. Actually, yeah, what you're looking at as a mosaic is, uh, uh, was helped put together by Ken Kramer. And Ken Kramer is not a scientist. He's a, in a, he's a, uh, a, a, a popular science writer and a, and a, and a really neat guy and, and really loves the program. And he just was driven to be able to put multiple pictures together and, and, uh, uh, and work with JPL to do that. So, so thank you, Ken Kramer, for that. But in reality, one of the things that really got me excited that the public found was a very unusual looking surface feature that looked like a crater. But when you took a good look at it, there was a shadow deep and it was a hole. And when, it, when we stepped back and looked at it, it actually was an empty lava tube for which the roof had collapsed. Mm. Now, if, if I was an astronaut going to the surface of Mars, that's one of the places I would go as a potential uh, place to start uh, uh, a habitat and then explore from. So uh, that was really neat. Yeah, and then students. now, they're, now, yeah, that was a student. And, and now others are being found, too, because of that. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Great. Another question in the back here. Hello. My name is Selwyn Lashley. I'm from Maryland. My, I have two questions, really. My first question is, is it, is it possible that there would be elements on Mars that do not exist on Earth that your instruments would not be able to detect? And the second question is, are you at any point developing the ion engine to be used in space for space travel? Well, the first one, um, we don't expect to find any elements that, don't, that we don't find here or at least theorize exist. Um, mainly because we kind of understand how atoms are made and that sort of thing. But related to that is we might be able to find minerals or even compounds that we haven't thought about here on Earth because Mars is in such a, a different environment of being so much colder and, and, that, and drier. There may be minerals that as soon as they warm up to room temperature, they disappear or change into something else. Um, ion engine? Yeah, the ion engine idea uh, is a great one. And in fact, um, uh, NASA tested an ion engine with Deep Space One, uh, I guess that at least 15 years ago. Currently, we're flying an ion engine on a spacecraft called Dawn. And Dawn has gotten in orbit around an asteroid called Vesta. An asteroid is out in the asteroid belt in between Mars and Jupiter. And it, it, it uh, orbited uh, Vesta for about a year. And using its ion engines, it pulled itself out of orbit and now is vectoring itself towards a fabulous asteroid called Ceres, which is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. And what we found out about Vesta is that Vesta is what we would call a planetary building block. It's one of the, one of the ones that's remaining in our solar system that helped build up planets like the Earth and Mars. All right, one last one here. Sayreville, New Jersey. I'm, I'm curious, uh, I know you guys moved to a reactor with Curiosity, um, getting away from all the problems and the lifespan of uh, solar arrays. What are you hoping for, you know, when 2020 rolls around uh, as far as like size and weight requirement decrease? Um, and are there any tools that you left off that you wish you could have put on, you just didn't have enough power to run them? That's a great question. Yeah, uh, uh, Curiosity is run from plutonium-238. Uh, there's a, uh, the, uh, the plutonium is stored in this element behind the rover, and uh, uh, it's the heat from that reaction, uh, which is uh, um, uh, a very nice uh, decay of plutonium uh, that allow and gets very hot and allows us to take that heat, create electricity, which charges the battery, which runs the rover. And so it operates day and night, all the time, charging the battery up, we expect the rover to uh, last for many years. It has a power supply that will last for tens of years if the rover is healthy. And this does indeed eliminate the problem of trying to get uh, uh, our, our solar panels uh, cleaned off because we know Mars is now a very dusty atmosphere. It's one of the reasons why we didn't think Spirit and Opportunity would last as long because the dust would settle. They survived because the dust was blown off by, by surprise. The dust devil, so, so that, was a, that was a great thing. Well, we can't, can't let that happen to Curiosity. It really needs the long-term power, and the plutonium does that. The 2020 rover is going to be based on the same chassis, 
And so we are indeed um, 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 currently baselining what we call it, planning on, on using the, uh, the radioisotope power because we believe that rover will also have to be able to exist and move on the surface for at least two years. And we have a science definition team that's going to yeah. figure out what tools. What it does, right. a science definition team figuring out what tools. But as an example, one of the things that uh, we had hoped to put on uh, Curiosity to start with was a core. Because if you can go into a rock, pull it out, and see if there's layering in the rock, that would be great to know. Right now it's a drill, so you get powder and you can measure it. But you don't know what the structure of the rock itself is on, on that scale. So one of the things that we hope to do, and the science definition team will determine whether or not it's manageable, um, is to have a core instead of just a drill. Well, thanks again to our, our great panel here. We've got a lot to look forward to in the future of Mars exploration. And between you guys here and the folks all over the country working on our Mars missions, um, you know, I think that we've got the planet well covered. And thanks again to our, our folks who have asked some great questions today. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> thank you to all. Thank you to all of our panelists, and for those who came here for the presidential inauguration, and those that are here with NASA Social. To follow us on social media, go to at NASA on Twitter. We're also on Google Plus and on Facebook, and. Uh, you can also follow us on uh, nasa.gov slash nasa social if you'd like to attend one of these events or on Twitter at nasa social. Uh, and at the same time, remember, keep asking us, NASA, what's next? As you can see from today, we're happy to tell you. Thank you. <laughs>